hard hardware battlefield. So what's going to happen now is our, I'll take that mic from you, Chris. Thank you so much. Our uh, stage guys here are going to reset the stage, and we're going to start Hardware Battlefield, which is an extension of Startup Battlefield, which is what TechCrunch does at Disrupt. We have hand-selected from about 700 different companies, 16 companies to present here the next two days, and they are competing to win $50,000, a big trophy, and the press will, will flog over them, so they're very excited to do this. Now, they've worked very long to prepare for their pitches. They've gone through a lot of practice and, and a lot of... Uh, um, of demos, so please be respectful and, and let them come do this. So, I think, are we almost ready? Jordan can come on up and talk to me, so I don't keep on sounding like a, like a dummy here. I thought Anthony was supposed to be up here with you. I don't know where Anthony is. Anthony is literally right there. We need to get it together. Well, he got Raise your hand if you think we need to get it together. Yeah. <laughs> you should come up on stage and try this, jerk. All right. Um, <laughs> so we have three companies in this, in this session. In this first round. That is true. We also don't have Slava Rubin. Is Slava Rubin anywhere? If you can hear me, Slava, we need you. Oh, good. Um, so that's fun. You might have to step in and be a judge this time. But we've got some amazing judges, including Chris Anderson and Trey Vassalo. And uh, we've got three awesome companies. We saw rehearsals, and these companies have come a long way in the past few months to have the best possible six-minute presentation, so that's they exciting. They really have, yeah. We have some, uh, some good judges this afternoon, too, so we're going to do this again at 2 o'clock yeah, with I have four more companies. Down. Oh, you're prepared this time. Yeah, I got all kinds of stuff going on. James Park, uh, who's the Fitbit CEO and founder, he's going to be um, one of our judges, and Mark Fields. Mark Fields, the CEO of Ford. Who you've been so excited about talking yeah. with. They, I, I hear they're talking to Google, so we're going to... <laughs> For like the last 24 hours, Matt has just been like, Ford, Google, Ford, Google. Uh, Greg Hu, who is a Nest product manager. and Yep, so he works at Nest now. He was a high-level product manager at Apple before. And then Jenny Fielding, um, who is all over the place. She was the head of digital ventures at BBC. Uh, her resume is too long for me to read, to be perfectly honest. And now she's the managing director of the Techstars RGA Accelerator. All right, so. well, I'm going to go get Trey, and I'll, I guess I'll be a judge. Yeah, find Slava if he's around. Otherwise... He's here? Oh, he's here. He's here. Amazing. Well, let's bring the judges on up. Well, well yeah, I guess, yeah, what you, you go away. Um, first up, like we've been talking about this whole time, uh, we've got Chris Anderson, formerly a Wired editor and now a 3DR founder. Just pick a seat, any seat. Yeah, it's your choice. Uh, Slava Rubin, the Indiegogo co-founder and CEO. If you want to come join me on stage, just in a minute, whenever he's ready. And then we'll get Trey up, actually, first. Is Trey ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. Come on up here. Trey Vaslow is a KPCB partner. Uh, she had her own design firm called, is it IDEO? Oh, no, I worked at Worked at IDEO. Yeah. Good enough, though. But it's called IDEO, so I got it right. And she has a master's in mechanical engineering and an MBA from Stanford, so... She's just a touch smarter than me on the stage, and I'm, my ego is hurting from it. Um, and our first company up is Stereo Labs, but we're going to wait to see if we can get Slava on the stage. He is here, but he doesn't want to come on stage. I'm unclear. Hey, hey, Slava. He's tossing phones. So you guys have one mic to share. Don't fight. Um, and we'll be good to go. Uh, like Matt said, this is pretty simple. Six minutes of pitch. They're going to do a live demo of a really cool gadget. Our judges are going to chime in, give some feedback, ask some questions. And at the end of the whole competition, we will crown a winner who will get $50,000. So without any further ado, we're going to throw six minutes on the clock for our first company, Stereo Labs, which is human eyes for machines. I don't even know what that means. Can't wait to learn. Go ahead, hit it. Hi. So let's start. Future has huge promises, and we're all excited about what's coming. Whether it's having our packages delivered by drones, or having completely autonomous cars, or having robots helping us every day. But all these technologies are still years away. Why? In order for all these devices to navigate the world around them, they need to see like we do with two eyes in 3D. 
they have to have cameras. Can you go back? <laughs> to have to, they have to have cameras that help them identify obstacles in order to avoid them. And until now, cameras could capture images like this, flat 2D images, without, with no sense of precise distance between the object and the obstacles. And people have tried to build 3D cameras. I'm sure you're all familiar with Kinet cameras, but they're extremely short range, meaning they only see up to three meters, and they only work indoors. So say goodbye to your drones and cars. And when you have 3D cameras that actually work outside, they're about $60,000, so that's pretty expensive. Next slide. So we at Stair Labs have solved this problem. We have created the Z camera, the first universal 3D camera. Next. How does it work? It's very simple. It works exactly like human vision. It takes a left and a right picture of the scene, and then our software calculates the distance of every single pixel within the image. Then it tracks the position of the camera while you're moving, and then fuse all this data into a 3D model in real time. So let's watch a live demo. So here you can see the Z camera connected to a laptop, and Oliver is going to scan in real time the stage. So what's amazing with this camera is that it's a USB camera available online for $449, and you can create 3D model of any type of environment, indoors, outdoors, and on a large scale. So Oliver is going around the counter, and he's going to show us the result. So you have to think about a 2D image of the counter. And now let's see a 3D image of the counter. So you actually have the distance of the whole scene. So imagine a car, a drone, or a robot. It can actually understand the space around it. All of this was done in real time. And you can easily plug it into any type of machines. OK. So let's switch back to the computer. You guys can totally clap if you want, too. That was pretty cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. It's coming. You can go ahead and keep talking through yeah. it. He'll get his slides figured out. I don't want okay. you to run out of time. Thank you. Uh, so what's the main use case? Of course, it's autonomous, autonomous robotics. So with the Z, uh, any type of machine can understand the space around it, and it becomes actually possible and much easier to build intelligent autonomous machines. OK, got it. And so what's the secret source behind this camera, which looks very simple? For the past four years, we have been working with biggest uh, studios in Hollywood to capture 3D movies. And we have worked with James Cameron uh, team to build the most advanced 3D camera for Avatar sequel. But last year, we said, OK, why don't we bring our technology not only to movie producers, but actually to any developers in the world who wants to build an affordable machine? And we have been able to do this thanks to a great team. Next slide. Um, so, we're a team of experts in 3D. Oliver is an expert in computer science. Edwin is a, an expert in computer vision. And I have been leading this company for the past four years. Next slide. So, we're selling the Z to developers for $449. And we're also selling the Z as OEM board to uh, manufacturers who want to integrate the Z into their devices. We launched the first version of the Z camera last year, and it has been massively adopted by top tier companies worldwide. And today, next slide, we're excited to launch our new ZFoo application, which is our 3D scanning software, which you just seen. 
And if you're interested in building this with us, go on our website and order a Z camera. Thank you. Awesome. A little time to spare. Throw into you guys. I expect you to have lots of thoughts on this, Chris. Uh, yeah, I mean, so um, I've seen a lot of things that appear to do the same thing. They use the Movidius chipset. They're a lot cheaper, and they, we have a number of them ourselves, and they all seem to work pretty well. Um, what is, how does yours differentiate from, for example, the ones that, uh, that uh, DJI or the Movidius team are doing? Uh, so, um, stereo vision is very simple. It's a left and a right camera. Mm. Problem is auto calibration. These two eyes, like ours, need to be perfectly aligned and perfectly matched. And when you put a camera on a drone, it moves very fast. Mm. So, you're actually losing this al alignment between these two cameras. So, stereo vision is very simple, but it's a very uh, hard technology. So, and this is why our five years experience in the movie industry allowed us to create this powerful software that calibrates the camera and actually gives a reliable information to the drone or the robot. So you're using commodity hardware, you're using things yeah. like the Movidius chipset? No, it's two uh, sensors, two oh. cameras, and everything is done in, uh, it, everything is the software, so you only need a GPU, a regular GPU. So there are no specific chip. So why is it so expensive? because we spent five years developing it. So, but as soon as we're uh, selling more and more, it's going to decrease, of course. And, uh, what, what would be the like, OEM price? It would be about $49. Thanks. Oh, sure. Um, I'm not as advanced as Chris, but just so I understand, what's the uh, uniqueness here? Is it the hardware? Is it the format in terms of the compression? Is it the software that the player was on? Did you make that player? So which of those three things is your like, uh, proprietary stuff? The most important thing is software. So it's really the software that understands a left and a right image and extracts as much data as possible. So and you know like when you showed the actual uh, screen later, is that your own software or is that yes. somebody? So you made that? Yeah, and this is what we're launching today, actually. Right, right. great. So that's proprietary. How yeah. about in terms of like compressing the files for the imaging and to be able to share all that? Is that your own proprietary? Yep. Okay, and then the hardware we said is basically not proprietary hardware. No, it's proprietary, but okay. it's simple because it's only two regular cameras, but it's our, uh, it's our camera. Gotcha. And then in, you said that you launched last year and you already had a fast start. What kind of. You didn't speak to numbers. Can you speak to numbers? Uh, we don't give up numbers, but it has uh, ma been massively adopted by uh, any type of company, robotics, especially cars, but also in very different applications like business analytics to count people in malls or for security purpose, virtual reality, augmented reality. So we are having a tremendous uh, momentum. So not to monopolize, my last question is, so far all of your answers have always been business-related answers, not consumer-related answers. So why do you have a consumer-related approach at all? Because uh, it's coming, it's coming. So for the moment it's towards, we're targeting businesses, but uh, we're talking about uh, virtual reality and augmented reality application for consumers. Okay. So my question really was revolving around, it's hard to launch a new technology into a new industry when, it's, when you're not controlling the whole customer experience. So you're, you've got to get a new company that's developing a new product to adopt your technology into that stack. So it sounds like, and you led to this with your question, you're also focused on a full encompassed product that is using your technology that you're going to sell to a customer. Yeah. Can you say anything more about that? Because I tend to be really skeptical of you know, everyone's, you know, you're, you're betting life or death on you getting to market. You're not going to want to bet yourself on another I'm startup sure company. Exactly. So, so what more can you you're, say about you're that? You're completely right. So uh, we have uh, built this. Can you go to the next slide, actually? So we really build the Z camera as an end-to-end -end solution. So anybody, not only machine manufacturers, but you can have a Z camera and just plug it into any laptop or even iPad or tablets. So you can actually, for example, scan your home. Let's say you want to redo your home. You just take the camera, scan your environment, and then you can change everything you want, the walls, the furnitures. So we're talking about this application, really giving 3D vision not only to machines, but also to you to be able to measure everything around you. Yeah, well, I would encourage you, when you have something that has universal in it, oftentimes it, it then is confusing to the customers. They don't know why they want to buy this product. So if that is the use case, then I would make sure that 
how you talk about the product and how it's you, it, it, every little piece is, is sort of tailored to that use case. Um, and so I guess uh, what I'm saying is it's really important to be, I think, more focused yeah. than not yeah. on the customer application because by saying something is universal, you almost dilute the premise a little bit too much and, and, and cause a little bit of confusion. Yeah, so we're using the term universal more for the technology because compared to what's existing now, it's Kinect and LiDAR. And this is not, people cannot use it. Our camera is just two sensors. So th this is why we're using the universal term. But you're definitely right for the applications. Hopefully this is a softball and you could just show off. Um, when you mentioned Avatar, I got really excited. You know, it was like movies and James Cameron. I didn't quite catch the connection between James Cameron and what I see on the screen. So can you just like put those dots a little closer together? Yeah, so it's exactly the question you asked before. What's our unique uh, uh, selling point? It's the software. And the software is what we developed for James Cameron camera. So he built this huge camera for Avatar and Avatar sequel. But the problem is that the cameras were not perfectly aligned. So this is why maybe when you went to the movie theater, it was maybe uncomfortable. So we came up for that, trying to correct the images and making the most comfortable experience in 3D movies. And this is exactly the same technologies. I had two Real really quick, quick follow-up questions. Real quick. I, you said GoPro was using it. How's GoPro using it? Uh, so it's definitely for drones. So the idea is to detect obstacles and avoid them, and also do 3D scanning of uh, statues or garden. This is what we have been doing. Good. And one other quick one. Um, Intel yesterday announced their RealSense technology, which seems like it does the same thing. How does it compare? Uh, so. Uh, so let's talk about universal technology. You need an Intel chip to make it work. Uh, so this is a big difference. And uh, we see from one meter to 20 meters away, real sense is up to seven to eight meters. Are we good judges? Okay, big round of applause for Stereo Labs. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna do a quick set change and I'm gonna chat with our judges. It seemed like Trey, your biggest concern was focus. Yeah, you know, I've seen a lot of companies that come out and they try to be a, a technology piece in an emerging industry, and no one really knows what that emerging industry is going to look like. So the customers aren't in control of their destiny yet, and they're not in control of their destiny yet. I think that's a really tough place to be. And so I'd rather see a company like this focus on something where they can control the whole customer experience. And Another, another customer, a drone company or somebody else may buy it at some point, but they can't bet the life of their company on that quite yet. Well, what I also find interesting is you guys all seem to be pushing towards the consumer application as opposed to an enterprise application. Normally, you, you see investors no, want the it, other. It, it, it could be an enterprise application, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the two thoughts for me is uh, focus. I think it's really hard to be a uh, consumer and enterprise at the same exact time, especially when you have like two or three employees. So uh, I thought all of the answers were very enterprise focused, so I would just stick to that. And the other thing is it seemed like because they had four or five years of experience and some costs, they wanted to pass that on into the initial cost of the product, which time has really gone by and the cost of these products have been commoditized and it's gone down. So I think you need to enter the market at a much lower cost right away. Yeah, I, I like them. Um, I agree with everything you guys said. I think it's an enterprise product. I think it's, uh, what I like about them is that they can use commodity hardware. Um, the competitors have proprietary hardware, and we as a customer don't want to be locked into anybody's um, proprietary hardware. So if they're a software company and they can support a range of commodity hardware, then, you know, I'd be happy to pay them $29.99. <laughs> you know, some amount per, per vehicle. For Already that, negotiating. For it's pretty early for that, don't you think? I can go lower. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How close are